uh, where I think over in Gravit or somewhere, uh, a gentleman um, um, killed all of his family and himself. Um, that uh, gentleman um, is the stepson of Betty Barnes, who comes to our church. Spoke with her last night. Of course, her heart is broken. Um, but you know, where more grace is needed, more grace is given by God. And so she said, I probably won't be at church in the morning. <laughs> And uh, so uh, that family's hurting and it's grieving. And so um, I thought it'd be a good thing for us to do as a church family is just have a moment of prayer for that family that uh, God would sustain her and her family through all of this and um, that God would carry them as needed. So can we take a moment to do that? Father, we just come to you right now for one of our members, Lord. We love our members. And Lord, we know that when uh, our members are grieving, we're grieving. And so, Lord, we know things happen in life. and uh, that are not necessarily your will. But, Father, we pray right now that, um, that this sweet family that is uh, left with picking up the pieces of this terrible tragedy, Lord, um, would know that their church loves them. And they would know that God loves them and that God will carry them through a very difficult time, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we have that in our lives. Uh, for, Lord, how would we be able to go through struggles like that? Again, Lord, we thank you praise you and we love you in Jesus name amen brother I feel like my mic's kind of cutting in and out a little bit okay so for you folks over in the gathering I apologize for that and so I'm going to go to this microphone and so hopefully you'll be able to hear all the words and not just some of them um, happy 4th of July. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're already past it, but I trust you had a great weekend. I trust you got to, uh, to rest and have some fun and go see a fireworks display and all those different things that we do uh, around the 4th. Um, for Cheryl and I, we, uh, we, we went over to, um, to the AMP and watched them there, but we might have been a little too close to the action. Because as the fireworks, we had to actually not just look up, but look directly up uh, to see the fireworks. And there was the slightest amount of wind that was coming in our direction. And so, Mike, we felt the debris. We were in the debris field as it fell and hit us. Well, when Cross Church had their display, we thought because the kids get a little nervous about that, we would go a little farther away and we could hardly see the fireworks. So we went to two displays. For one, we were too close and for one, we were too far away. <laughs> so, but, but anyway, we had a great time, and it was, it was amazing. You know, God's blessed us, right? I mean, to be in a country like we live in, and, you know, we're, we're great at complaining about our country, but I wonder how, how good we are about praising our country as well. Uh, there, you know, uh, the, the idea and the mere fact uh, that in America everybody can speak their mind uh, brings conflict, doesn't it? Because we're not going to agree with everything everybody else says. I mean, my goodness, Baptists are famous for complaining, you know, uh, uh, not being, having conflict about what color the carpet is, right? And so we're there too. But I can tell you this, God has blessed this country. And, and, and it took a lot of uh, very brave men and women giving of everything that they could give so we'd have the country that we have. Does anybody agree with that? And so where we do have some problems in this country, and we do have some disagreements in this country, uh, can you think of another country that you'd rather be in? I mean, people are, uh, they're coming here by the droves, not because it's a bad place to be, but because there's opportunity uh, here. So, so I think we got a lot to celebrate in this country. Uh, so anyway, today I'm going to start a, uh, a series. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a long series because... Uh, I, I want to, uh, the, the book of Hebrews is a wonderful book, and I've got a study guide that's helping me through this a little bit, and it was entitled, Jesus is Better. And, and so it, it, it intrigued me as I stood this, saw this study guide, but it is a very, um, uh, a very detailed book. So it's going to take me a long time to go through this sermon series, so I'm going to break it up probably into three parts. We're going to do some now, we'll do some maybe in January, and then maybe some more back next summer so it doesn't kind of get monotonous as we go through because this book is too good for us to just skate over so today uh, so we're going to take um, uh, the first three verses and we're going to try to do what's called to exegete 
or to go through in detail this passage. So, um, uh, so this morning, uh, don't be afraid when I tell you that I've got seven points to today's sermon, seven. Usually it takes me about 40 minutes to get through three points. Uh, today, we may be here all into the afternoon. Um, but I was telling my wife last night, I said, if, if, you will, if you will bear with me through points one through five, you're going to love point six and seven. So when, when, when I get there, it's all going to be worth it. So, but let's dig into this, to this, great, to this great book here. I mean, at the time of the writing of the book of Hebrew, it was a lot like the times that we're living in today in that people everywhere were suggesting that there are more, than, more ways to get to heaven than one. I mean, it seems counterintuitive uh, for us when, when we think about there being more than one way to get to, G, to, to, get to heaven because we know, uh, because we believe in the Word of God, that the only way to heaven is through, through Jesus. See, I mean, not one person out there said Muhammad. Not one person out there said Gandhi. Not one person out there said uh, any Oprah Winfrey. Uh, no, no, they didn't say that. I mean, everybody out there said what? Jesus, okay? So, it, so this book of Hebrews... Um, it returns again and again to the word better. We talked about, if you saw Tyler's uh, video, went on Facebook this week, uh, there's some 30-something times in the book of Hebrews that, go, that fall into about 13 categories where, where Hebrews talks about that Jesus uh, is, is better. Uh, in in uh, chapter 1, verse 4, it talks about Christ is better than the angels. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 19, he's a better hope. Because he's the better mediator of a better covenant, which was established by better promises. It just goes on and on and on, talking about how Jesus is better. And so that in itself is a good reason to study uh, the book of, of Hebrews. So we don't know the exact writers. Some people think that it was Paul because of writing style and all that. But the bottom line is we really don't know, and the book doesn't say. And so we're going to say we don't know. But it was originally written to a group of people who, much like the people around us, uh, were giving up on their faith um, but they're being encouraged like we are to take stock of what Jesus has to offer what he has done and what he will do for you and me you know I go back and I, and I think about what, what Betty told me last night she says you know I don't know why this happened but I do know that God's going to get me through it and, and in, the, in, in your time of, of deepest despair in your time when things are not going well at your time uh, when the wheels have fallen completely off and you feel like you've been ran over by the bus what a comforting thought to know that you are not by yourself that you are not alone that you have God with you inside of you working from the inside out to make the awful things of life more palatable easier to handle you know the loneliest times of our lives are when we're alone those of you that's lost a spouse or lost a child or even lost a job or, or, or ha you know, I, I don't let Cheryl go on vacation because uh, by herself because it makes me lonely at home, right? Nobody likes to be lonely. With Jesus, you never have to be lonely, right? So let's take a look at it. Um, seven points here, but they're quick. So you just bear with me. If you're taking notes, I'll try to give you the numbers of each one of them so you can take the notes more clearly. Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 3. I'm reading out of the New International Version. It should be on the screen for us. It says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things and through whom He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. And after He had provided a purification for sins, He sat down at the right, at the, um, right hand of, of the majesty in heaven. So if you look at those three verses, actually in verses 2 and 3, there are seven distinct things that he talks about in there, and we're going to take each one of those, and we're going to break them down uh, as time permits. So let's pray. Father, we give you praise for this book in the Bible, Lord, that it is there for your glory and for our edification. Lord, I pray that this morning we could catch a glimpse, Lord, of how much better that Jesus is than any religion that we could try to replace him with. And, Lord, we just pray that you would just speak to us this morning. We pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 
Okay, so if you look at verse 1, it talks about that God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. Now, ever since the world began, God has been speaking to human beings at different times. I mean, if you remember Adam and Eden, and uh, Eve in the Garden of Eden, God came and he walked with them and had direct conversations with them. And then later on, God spoke through the prophets. And as he spoke through the prophets, his people listened. And the reason was simple, because when the prophets spoke, the people knew that they were hearing from God. The Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1 says, The prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so we see in the, in the Old Testament, all through the Old Testament, how these prophets of God were spoken to directly from God, uh, and then they spoke to the, the people. So, I mean, the point here is this, though, that God is no longer speaking to us through prophets. But now His will, thank God, is presented by God's own Son who came to earth, spoke the truth, and died to give us life. So the prophets in their time, let me tell you a word that, that comes up from time to time in study. It's a word called dispensation. Dispensation. Now, it's, it's a really churchy word, but it's really easy to explain. Uh, when, when God, you know, God has, God sees time from the beginning to the end. Everybody with me? God sees time from the beginning to the end. And so God, in his own uh, sovereignty, dispenses time to us in various ways. So this dispensation, the key word in that is dispense. And so you look at all of history, and God broke those down and into areas. And so in that particular dispensing of time, does that make sense? Dispensing of time, he spoke through the prophets. Before that, he spoke in different ways. After the prophets, when Jesus came, in that dispensation or that dispensing of time, God gave us, uh, he speaks through us, uh, through, through what Jesus did, through the words of Jesus and through his word who he gave us through, uh, through the Holy Spirit. And so we're in that dispensation of time now where we're spoken to uh, through the words of Jesus. Does that all make sense? Is that too deep for you? No, surely not. Y'all are, are, are Baptists, so come on. Um, but the point is, we're no longer being spoken through, uh, through prophet. We're spoken through, through God's Son. Uh, John MacArthur says in his commentary, Every religion is but man's attempt to discover God. Christianity is God bursting into man's world and showing and telling man what he's like. So let's take a better, let's take a look at this great book and discuss seven, seven, uh, good reasons, great reasons why Jesus is better than the prophet. So we're going to go back and we're just going to read verses 2, 3 so it's fresh on your mind. I'll put some inflection on each one of my points as you go along so you'll kind of have an idea of where we're going. So verse 2, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. <laughs> Here we go sustaining all things by his powerful word after he had provided purification for sins he sat down you're going to love that sat down Woo, mercy I just about could just turn to the last page and talk about sat down right now you're going to like that so hang in there with me at the right hand of the majesty in heaven first Jesus is better than the prophets and any other religion because he is heir he is the heir of all things chapter 2 verse 2 here whom he, God, has appointed heir of all things. You know, when, when you're, when you're the, the person that's going to receive everything, I mean, we, we, we're, we, my mom's now in, in a nursing home, and we're about to sell all the things that she has. And because of that, my sister and I, who are the heir of that, will get all those things. M much rather mom be back in her house and keep all that stuff. I don't want it. I want her to be, be happy. But, but, but you think about, here's the interesting thing about that. Jesus is the heir of all things from God. But God's never going to die, right? So how's Jesus going to get all this stuff because God will never die? It's a good question, isn't it? Now, do I have any scholars in here? <laughs> God gave Jesus all these things, made him the heir right now. And we'll see that as we go on through the book, okay? So Christ is the Son, and particularly the only Son of God, so He's the heir of all things. 
and he's the heir of all things point two because he is the creator of all things uh, verse two the second part of that verse and to whom he made the universe now look over with me if you'll see it on the screen in Colossians chapter 1 the Apostle Paul says of Christ's relation to the creation he says this for by him by Christ by him all things were created things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things were created by him and watch this for him he is before all things and in him all things hold together Paul explained that things are not only made by him by Jesus but they're also made for Jesus he is the heir of all these things all of it belongs to him in uh, the the uh, in John chapter 1 verse 3 it says through him all things were made without him nothing was made that has been made so it's interesting here it, 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 I, I thought this was really cool you may not but anyway here in chapter 2 verse 2 he says Jesus made the universe now in your translation it may say Jesus made the world or the worlds and you'd expect as you go deeper into this as you look at the commentaries you'd expect that word worlds or universe to be the normal Greek word of cosmos and cosmos just means the physical world that's out there but there's a different Greek world, uh, Greek word that that's not only the the physical, but it's also everything. It's the word uh, aeonos, which means the ages. So listen, this is where it ties together. Jesus not only made the universe, made the physical things that are in the universe, but he also brought space, time, and matter into existence. So when you when we think about making something. We take the raw materials and we made it, and we make it. If I was going to build a house, I would call in my order to the lumber yard, and I'd say, I need this many two bys and this many two by sixes, this much rock, and this much stone, and this much drywall, and this much, and this much, and this much, and they would deliver all that to me. And then when I got finished, I would end up with a house, hopefully. Hopefully. But in this case, Jesus made the raw materials, and then he put them together. See the difference? There's a difference between the word cosmos and the word uh, aeonos. So Jesus made it all. Nothing was made except for the stuff that was made by him. So he's not only the sustainer of the universe, but point number three, excuse me, the creator of the universe, but point three, he is the sustainer of the universe. I find this interesting because uh, in, 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 uh, back in verse two again, in part C here, sustain, it says sustaining all things by his powerful word back in Genesis how did God create the universe how did God create everything by spoken word he God spoke and everything came into order you think about how powerful that the word of God is we think we're powerful by what we can do Jesus God he is powerful by what he says what he says um, he sustains it now when you start thinking about this word sustain think about this imagine what would happen if the earth's rotation slowed down just a little if it slowed down just a little or if it sped up just a little what would happen if the Sun whose temperature is 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit what if it were any closer to us we'd burn up what happened if it somehow slid away from us or if we slid away from the Sun a little bit we would freeze to death our globe is tilted on an exact angle of 23 degrees that provides us with four seasons it has just the right wobble <laughs> if it were not so tilted vapors from the ocean would move north and south and develop into monstrous can uh, continents of ice if the moon <laughs> did not retain its exact distance from the earth tides would flood the land completely twice a day Tide goes in goes out how do you think that stays in order we got two choices you can believe that over millions of years that the earth somehow evolved into that you believe that I'm, and listen if, if you believe in evolution that's your choice you're 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 a free American but it makes a whole lot more sense to think that somebody else is keeping that thing in motion. It's keeping that earth at just the right distance. That's keeping that sun at just the right temperature. That's keeping the moon exactly where it's supposed to be. 
and who also died on the cross for you so that you could have an eternal life with him doesn't that make the most sense <laughs> well he is not only the sustainer of the universe but number four see I'm zipping along in these things <laughs> number four he is the radiance of God's glory this took me a while because it's just this one little verse here but this word radiance kept kept uh, ringing back into my mind in verse 3 and I'm skipping around just a little bit because for effect here but in verse 3 the first part here it says the Sun is the radiance of God's glory now so I got to think about the word radiance you think about the word radiance we, we, radiance you know is, is light and not only is it light have you ever seen somebody that come back from say Costa Rica or something and had a really bright sunburn because they'd been out in the Sun too long that would kind of be radiance wouldn't it but in Moses day the radiance that he had on his face was because he, he'd been in the presence of God so whenever I think of the radiance of God's glory my mind kind of goes back to Moses when he came down off Mount Sinai with the stones holding the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 34 in verse 29 it says when when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord Moses' face was radiant because he'd been in the presence of God now wouldn't that have been something so you, you know you see this guy come down on here and his his light the light off of him was reflecting the radiance of God and the people were afraid of him because of it I think I would be too yeah you, you've been somewhere where a nuclear reactor kind of messed up I don't know but but the, but the people saw him were afraid he said come close I got something to tell you and then he had to put a veil over his face if you remember the story because his face was so bright he would only take the veil off when he went into the tabernacle to talk with God or when he would speak to the people and the rest of the time he kept a veil over his face you know in my mind's eye I see Christians with faces so radiant of God's glory we don't need a veil but that light would so shine we wouldn't put a basket over it but instead we'd put it up on a mountaintop so that people could see how good that God is you know and after Moses then come along Jesus and underneath his human appearance as a Jewish carpenter turned preacher and teacher was God's radiant glory and his face didn't glow like Moses, but everybody saw Jesus and was attracted to the light that he gave to the world. Everything about Jesus represented. He didn't reflect God. He is God. And so that drew people to him. And the prophets, you know, the prophets could only tell people about what they saw and heard. Jesus was himself the message. So that's, that's that. Number five. God is, He is, Jesus is, the exact representation of His Father. He is the exact representation of His Father. Here's something interesting. We try to be as much like God as we can. We want people to see it, right? We want people to see us and see Jesus through us. We want to be, something, we want to be somebody that reflects the glory of God. Jesus wasn't a reflection of, glory, uh, of the glory of God. He was the light, is the light of the world. And so, but when we see that light, we don't see a, we don't see a reflection of God. We see a representation of God. Verse 3 again, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says he is almost like a representation of his being. No, it says he is, I love this word. It, it, it just, it says so He is the exact representation of his being. Why? because the Trinity is three in one Jesus is not on the outside looking in he is a part of the Trinity at the beginning of his gospel John explained in John 1 it says no one has ever seen God but God the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known what does that mean well Philip uh, asked Jesus uh, to show him the Father remember that in, in, in John chapter 14 verse 9 Jesus looked at Philip and he says Jesus answered don't you know me Philip 
even after I have been among you such a long time. And then he goes on to explain to him, anyone who has seen me, who has seen me, who is Jesus, who has seen Jesus, has seen the Father. Why? Because he's the exact representation of God. So he says, how can you say, show us the Father? There is not one feature of the character of God that Jesus does not reveal. Reveal. Okay, all of that's what God is. And all of that is why Jesus is better than any other religion. But then look at verse uh, 3 again here, and we see the sixth point, that he is the redeemer of mankind. This is where it gets good, y'all. I mean, all the God's good. I mean, it's, it's awful nice that God created the heavens and the earth, and it's awful nice that he spoke through the prophets, and it's awful nice that we say all these things about what God is and Jesus is. But then you kind of, you know, in, in, the, in the nicety of all this, you go, well, that's good, but how does that affect me? Well, this point affects you. Because even though God created you, even though he made you, even though he built you, you are, uh, you have a seed, uh, excuse me, you have a seed of sin in your life. Anybody know that? And your, your tendency is to, to sin and to go against the glory of God. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen. Y'all know that verse? Woo! Ben, you, you're, not the only, Ken, you're not the only one that knows that verse. Amen? Yeah. Little girl here, she comes up to me and tells me her verses. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? Yeah, I'm a sinner. Yeah, I'm a sinner. I know. I'm a sinner. I know. I'm a sinner. What does that mean? It means you need a redeemer. What does that mean? If you fell into a lake and you couldn't get out, you'd need somebody to save you. You'd need somebody to throw you a life jacket. You'd need somebody to throw you a rope. You'd need somebody to come down and get you. And can I just tell you that that's what happened to us. We are drowning in a sea of sin, and we need a Redeemer. That's what Jesus is. And that's what makes Jesus better than any other religion because he's the only one that can back it up. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, After he had provided purification for sins now how do you do that he died on the cross shed his blood for us rose again uh, when Jesus went to the cross he he solved the problem of sin now th this word purification I like that word but I like better how it says it in the King James Version it says it like this it said after he had Jesus after he had by himself purged our sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high Listen, Jesus is better than religion because he by himself gave us a pathway to life. He purged, he purified, he made clean, he restored your relationship with God because he loved you. That's what makes him better than any other religion. Listen, any other religion that you'll look at, you have to work to get to where you're going. You have to do enough good things, enough right things, so that maybe sometimes, you, sometimes you can reach a bar, so that that religion will take you into their, their to their whatever their their religion is. And so, with Jesus on the other hand, says, "I'm going to do the heavy lifting. I'm going to be the redeemer. I'm going to be the one that does the heavy lifting, so that you'll be able to to surrender your life and to accept this gift of salvation that I've given you." Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That's what you've earned. But the what? Gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 1 Peter, uh, excuse me, Peter, 1 Peter, I think, uh, chapter 1, verse 18 says this, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life. Um handed down to you from your forefathers but with the precious blood of Jesus a lamb without blemish or defect now <laughs> I love to break down scripture I hope you I hope you get this but I was I, I, I found this scripture and I referenced it in right here because of the empty way of life but then I got to looking at the first part of the verse and I like that more than I like the second part look what it says that the first part of chapter uh, uh, first Peter chapter 1 verse 18 the first three words say what say what not on the screen so you can't see it for you know can I tell you that that may be the that may be one of the best phrases in the Bible that may be one of the best things that you could ever learn in your life about God for you know what do we know about God 
He's a friend that sticks closer to a brother. What do we know about God? He protects your salvation inside of his hand. His hand's covered by God's hand. You know that nothing can take that salvation away from you once you surrender your life to God. You know that that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. For you know that he'll never leave you or forsake you. For you know that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father advocating for you. For you know that he'll never leave you or forsake you. Those are things that you know. How good is that? I just had me a good time at my desk last night thinking about the things that I knew about God. So we're going to take 20 minutes, and you're going to write down all the things you know about God. Is that okay? God's good. And all the time. Amen. Point number seven. Jesus is not only the redeemer of mankind, but let's never forget. Let us not forget. Jesus is the ruler of the universe. I don't know about you, but that's comforting to me. In the, in the day that we're living in right now, I don't know that it's a lot different from any other day. Because when I read in Scripture, When I, when I read in Scripture, I find that there was sin all the way back in the Old Testament. And that sin had devastating effects. When I see what Scripture says and what history talks about, I see that there were bad governments out there. There were bad rulers, bad kings, good kings, bad people, good people. We're finding that's the same thing today. If not for the fact that I know, or I know, that God is in control and God is the ruler of the universe, I would be in despair and you should be too. But I know that no matter what happens on this earth, no matter how many tornadoes, no matter how floods, how many floods, no matter how many people get killed, no matter what happens in our government, good or bad, I know that at the end of the day, God wins the war. Woo! God wins the war. How good is that? So the last part of verse 3 says, after he provided purification for sins, he sat down. He, say that with me, he sat down. Say it again, sat down. He sat down. Okay, you got to get this one more time. He, y'all are good. Okay, he sat down. What difference does that make, Pastor? I'll tell you. Jesus is in control. When he had completed... This is good, y'all. Come on, Carrot, stay with me. When he had completed the redemption of man, he was escorted by the angels to the throne of the Almighty God. He sat down at the favored place of the Father with calmness and confidence. You say, boy, Pastor, why are you so excited about that? I'll I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Bear with me. In, In a book by Mar Rosenthal called Israel, My Glory, we read this. We know a great deal about the temple in Jerusalem and its furnishings. But fascinatingly, there were no chairs in this billion-dollar building that took 46 years to complete. Why? There were no chairs because the priests of Israel never sat down. They never sat down because their work was never done. Their work was never done because the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Now you following me? Now you you getting the idea why I sat down so good? It was a stopgap. It was temporary. It was incomplete. And so priest after priest, course after course, year after year, century after century, with monotonous repetition, they would come to the temple and they would function, but they would never sit down. They could never rest for their work was never done. The task was never completed, end quote. But Jesus, once for all time, paid the penalty for sin. And then the writer of Hebrew will later explain in chapter 10, verse 11 and 12, it says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Here comes that word. But when this priest, you know what? This priest is capitalized. You know why? Because this priest 
is the priest of all priests, the king of all kings, the son of glory. He is Jesus. This priest had offered for all time one sacrifice, one sacrifice for sin. Then it says, read on, he. Why did Jesus sit down? Because the job was done. <laughs> the job was done. Listen, you know, I, I, I don't know about you. I, 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 sometimes I get out and do a little work. And when I get done working, I get home and I've got this recliner. I push a button and it goes. And I sit down because the job is done. It feels good. And it should feel good to us that the job for our salvation has already been done. I told you you'd like these last two points, didn't I? The job for salvation, the job for redemption, the job for the glory of heaven has already been done and completed for you. Your job is to accept it and surrender your life to Him. Then you can sit down too. Because once you know Christ as your Savior, your work is complete as far as it relates to your salvation. Now, we got a few people that once they get saved, they sit down, period. We're not talking about discipleship here. We're talking about salvation. The work has been done. The Bible says, and then he sat down. His work is finished. He sat down. His position is fixed. And although I'm grateful that I live in a country that allows me to choose any religion, I'm grateful that I can still choose. And I hope that you will choose to follow Jesus. Why? Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Let's stand. Woo, thank you. Father, thank you, Lord, for this great message from your word, Lord, that we've been able to take and to understand why Jesus is better than anything else that we could get from religion. Lord, I pray that in this special time as we give the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to move among us, that he will do his work freely and without encumbrance. I pray that you would just bind Satan right now. We pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together.